Uh, hi, I'm Don Wallace. I'm Chamonix International Law Institute. I want to welcome you all. Yona always tells me to tell you about the International Law Institute, but I think I'll just refer you to our website, www.ili.org. I also want to welcome Dr. Buss, who's going to speak in a moment, I think, and Bob Turner, who I haven't seen for a while. Um, Yona, why don't I turn this over to you and let you introduce Dr. Buss and then introduce Bob. Okay, thank you very much, um, Don. Um, I know you're very modest about uh, your contribution in the ILI, um, but um, for me, I think it was uh, truly inspiring uh, over many, many years, decades actually. So what I wanted to do is uh, simply to mention the security through law. I don't know if you can see, uh, for example, one, one of our many reports. And last year, of course, uh, we had a series of about half a dozen zone conferencing and uh, we published a number of uh, reports uh, dealing with some of the legal issues and uh, sports and so on. I don't know if people are interested, but you're welcome to follow what we have done. And uh, now I hope that Dr. Jennifer Jen is with us. Is she there? I'm here. She is, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Jen, welcome to our event uh, today. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you know that uh, <clears throat> uh, Jen is now the CEO of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, she is um, truly um, a dedicated uh, scientist and she will tell you on some of the uh, significant uh, work that she and the Potomac are doing in this uh, critical area. And uh, as, uh, as an academic uh, focusing on, on terrorism, it was my uh, honor to uh, develop a relationship with uh, Mike Sweatman, who was one of the founders of the Potomac Institute. Sadly, uh, we miss him and his guidance at this time. So, Jen, why don't you uh, take over and uh, speak for a while and obviously join us for the discussion uh, during the session um, later on, uh, following some of the presentations. Great, thank you, Yona, for the introduction and thank you all for coming today um, for the opportunity to, to bring you in to speak. Uh, Jonas did a great introduction about the Potomac Institute. One of the things that we've prided ourselves on in the last 25 years is looking at disruptive threats, right? So everything science and technology policy-wise and, and all of the changing environments that that comes with. Uh, terrorism, as all of you know, has been a very disruptive threat um, for decades, and, and that's not changing. It's just maybe the way that they're approaching society is, is changing with the technology, right? Um, Jonas certainly done specific seminars over the last 20 years, focusing on the different types of disruptive threats within uh, that, that terrorists are taking advantage of. Um, the Institute, it works on, on these topics kind of across the board. Um, more recently, we're seeing more and more cases of cyber terrorism, but conventional terrorism isn't going away either. So it's more important than ever that we continue this dialogue and that we continue to stay focused on this as the most critical topic. Um, so I'm very proud to welcome all of you today. I certainly don't want to uh, take a lot of time away from our very distinguished speakers that are here with us. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Jen. And please uh, join us if you are able to <clears throat> discuss uh, some of the specifics that uh, the Potomac um, is dealing with, which is relevant to our discussion today. I would like to move on to our colleague, Professor uh, Bob Turner, um, who will make also opening uh, remarks. Um, 
fortunately for myself and our colleagues for decades, um, we were involved also in um, a partnership or relationship uh, living uh, with uh, the rule of, of law. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to mention that, that Bob actually uh, for decades, uh, he was uh, associated with uh, the University of Virginia School of Law, uh, where he co-founded the Center of National Security uh, Law. And uh, then he served as a professor for more than uh, three decades. Um, I, I'm aware of his uh, journey for many years. I'm mentioning this because he touched base with some of the most uh, um, productive, I think, prestigious institutions, uh, for example, the Naval uh, War College and the uh, AVA, and uh, also the Uber Institution at Stanford University. I think I met him at first when he was uh, the president of the United States uh, Institute uh, of Peace and uh, we welcome him, and obviously we appreciate very much his uh, guidance over the years. Bob? Thank you, uh, Yona. Uh, it is an honor to be here today. Uh, Yona and I go back, as he said, to the 1980s. Don Wallace goes back further than that. I met Al Gray, General Al Gray, when he was a two-star back in 83. Uh, and I certainly want to thank the Inter-University Center for Terrorism Studies and the Potomac Institute. Uh, uh, there are not many groups that can compete with, uh, with either in terms of their contributions to the important topics facing us today. We have a very distinguished panel today. I, I can't uh, refrain from uh, saying a special uh, hello to Guy Roberts when I was the Stockton Professor of International Law at the Naval War College. Guy was a Marine colonel and a student there who graduated first in his class, went on to be a senior fellow of our Center for National Security Law, and was a co-editor of our 1,600-page National Security Law and Policy casebook and other volumes. Uh, the threat caused by the COVID-19 pandemic are numerous. Some are obvious, some less so. Uh, the uh, International Monetary Fund has estimated that by the time it is over, the pandemic will cost about $39 trillion. Uh, that is going to cause, cause governments uh, to have to reallocate resources. Uh, and one of the big fears, and it's happened already in some cases, is they will take money previously allocated for counterterrorism purposes uh, and put it into uh, fighting the, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, or they will or and or they will cut foreign assistance to poorer countries that are victims of transnational terrorism. Both of these could have a devastating effect. The lethality of COVID-19 has increased the interest of ter transnational terror groups in acquiring biological weapons, far more devastating than uh, car bombs or uh, even flying airplanes in the large buildings. Jihadists have been recruiting PhDs with expertise in this area and have encouraged them to study scientific journals to learn more about these agents. Uh, uh, this is a very serious problem. Uh, the loss of more than two and a half million lives has angered people, family, friends, and others all over the world being cooped up at home uh, dealing with a pandemic has caused frustration, and dealing with new government restrictions has contributed to what Lenin used to call a revolutionary situation that encourages violent dissent and support for extremists. Perceptions of discrimination do harm. For example, delivering vaccines that require storage in extreme cold temperatures is inherently easier in developed countries than in countries that in some areas lack access to electricity. The lack of access will likely contribute to anger and make citizens who perceive they're not being treated fairly more receptive to radical causes. 
people around the world are spending more time online since they're confined in their homes. And terrorist groups have been or stepping up their propaganda efforts. School children, instead of being in classrooms, are at home on the computer, and some of them are being radicalized by these, uh, these uh, websites as well. And we're not just talking about Islamists, but uh, we also have a problem with far-right terrorists. ISIS and Al-Qaeda welcomed COVID-19 and described it as a plague sent by Allah to destroy infidels. They've encouraged people sick with the virus to visit public places to, affect other, to infect others. Repressive governments have used the pandemic to violate human rights and increase oppression. Uh, China has used the pandemic, for example, as an excuse to crack down on freedom in Hong Kong. This can contribute to terrorism, but by itself, it is, in, it is inherently harmful and should be of concern to anyone who cares about human freedom. These are but a few of the issues raised by the COVID-19 pandemic of relevance to the struggle against terrorism. They are extremely important, and we are all indebted to Yona, the Inter-University Center for Terrorism Studies, the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, for assembling such a distinguished panel of experts. Let me turn the microphone back to Yona so we can hear from the real experts. Well, your mother, uh, obviously, you, you outlined uh, quite an, an agenda. And uh, going all the way back, you know, we can raise the uh, questions uh, which are actually continuing. I mean, there are basically the three. I mean, a can or should history repeat itself? Uh, this is one, one of the questions. What else is new? What is next? Is the worst yet to come? Will civilization survive? I think some of these challenges we dealt with for a long time. Now, we're going to move on at least to one of the challenges that uh, uh, Professor Rita Carwell, who needs actually no, no introduction, as uh, many of you know, uh, she is a pioneering uh, micro biologist and um, with a very distinguished, uh, I think, background. In fact, I, I recall she was the first woman to lead the National Science Foundation and received many, many awards. Uh, her book, I just want to display that. Okay. I hope you can see that. This is the most uh, recent uh, book that she uh, published. And um, we are very fortunate to have a number of her publications already published related to biological terrorism and related to WMD. And uh, I, I think that her guidance and leadership is truly uh, appreciated. So Rita, why don't you take over? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well, Rita. Okay, good. What I wanted to point out is that um, we, we have not paid attention to the biological threat and the dangers that it poses for our country. We had the anthrax episode, but we were able to deal with it uh, very quickly, control it, and, and curb it very, very um, soon. We have suffered pandemics as a human population for centuries. And um, the current uh, pandemic is very much like the Justin plague in the fifth century. And um, we have not learned mm -hmm. how to deal with the pandemics. Now, one of the, this whole week, the National Science Foundation has been conducting a study, uh, a work, series of workshops starting on Monday and running until tomorrow afternoon focused on how do we predict pandemics. Now, I've been working currently on the COVID-19 pandemic. We have developed a, a nucleic acid technique that allows us to identify the presence of the virus and its variants in stool samples. Uh, this is important because what I would like to um, emphasize is that the ability to 
monitor the health of the community can be done effectively using um, sewage and wastewater monitoring. It, it's really rather strange that, um, for example, we will uh, go to a physician for an annual physical and a sample will be taken of blood, uh, of, of urine, but we have not uh, taken a stool sample, which we are learning in today's science developments that understanding the mix of microorganisms that comprises the bacterial flora of our gut on our skin, in our nasal passages, and affecting the various um, um, body, uh, we, we really are essentially walking microorganisms. It doesn't sound terribly attractive, but the <laughs> fact is we are about 80% microorganisms. It's just the fact that our cells are larger than the bacteria and the virus and the fungi and the protists. But with the COVID-19, we have been able to develop a technique that allows us to measure the presence uh, in wastewater. And that allows us by the numbers of virus and detecting the variants, it predicts four to seven days in the future, actual cases addressing um, physicians, going to hospitals, going to outpatients, going to physicians' offices. That is, we can predict the number of cases. The, this is not unique to the work that I've been doing, but in fact, fortunately, it has been uh, universally adopted and currently in practically every state now, um, since the last year, in the United States, there is a measurement of viruses in the wastewater um, ongoing. And it's provided as we do in the lab that I run, um, in Maryland, we're providing the governor of Maryland uh, an analyses every other day from about 50 sites. This includes not just the sewage treatment plants and their, their, the delivery sites. Um, we in, if we take samples from manholes in various parts of the state, but also at um, college dormitories, at uh, assisted living centers, and uh, similarly uh, at um, uh, hospital sites. This, this allows the ability to, to determine the presence of the virus and to predict, uh, in, let's say in a dormitory, if there's virus present in the, in the uh, wastewater that's uh, being discharged from the building, one can then test the individuals in the building rather than having to close down the entire campus and similarly for an assisted living facility. Now, in addition, um, we now have been able to use satellite imagery, which allows us to um, sense um, environmental parameters to detect um, um, dew point temperatures, uh, land temperatures, uh, and also to utilize uh, the sensors that mobilize, that, that, that um, measure the movement of populations. And with uh, very elegant models, we can now predict county by county the risk of COVID-19. Now, COVID-19, I think, exemplifies the fact that bio threats are very, very serious and incredibly uh, expensive in terms of the national economy and the global economy, which we all already heard some numbers. We have discounted the capacity of biological threats in a way and have focused very strongly and rightfully on the nuclear threats and um, the rogue nation of which there are a couple having access to nuclear weapons. But now I think we can appreciate the dangers and the concerns with biological threats. Now, we will, we have now six or seven vaccines. Uh, two are really well being distributed, um, the, the Moderna and the AstraZeneca. And we will have uh, uh, three or four more uh, available. So very likely we will within, I would say the end of this year, um, have sufficient vaccination uh, if, if we achieve about 70% uh, 
uh, vaccination, we will essentially have developed what's called the protective herd effect of uh, sufficient numbers so that we don't have a, a, a continued uh, contagion. The difficulty is we don't yet know for sure whether being vaccinated means that we don't shed the virus because we can perhaps be vaccinated but have a, an asymptomatic infection that means the virus would be shed, but the symptoms and the individual's um, effect uh, would be minimum. So, so we have a lot of, of um, scientific work yet to do. But the other caveat I would offer is that simply because we have um, addressed COVID-19, we may, we're already seeing variants with the capacity to be very highly transmissible. Because the COVID-19 is a member of the virus family, the covid avidity, it is very much like the human um, uh, influenza, which we have been dealing with for hundreds of years. And we now know that each year we have a variant that becomes a, uh, dominant and to which we need to be vaccinated. So we can anticipate uh, requiring additional vaccinations um, somewhat into the future. And more to the point, we now understand what a bio threat can do globally. And we need to address pandemics as one of the greatest threats to humanity, probably second only to climate change. Thank you, and apologies for not uh, showing the slides, but um, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this distinguished group. Thank you very much, Rita. Obviously, we'll be able to incorporate the slides, if you wish, in uh, our application. Of course, many of the issues that you raised, we're, we're going to come back to, to it, so no doubt about it, but uh, all of us uh, look at this terrible human uh, human cost um, in in the United States, uh, as as we know, uh, some uh, half a million uh, people, and uh, around the world about perhaps close to uh, two million um, five hundred thousand or something like that. So um, I I think obviously we. All of us, I'm sure, uh, would wish uh, to express, uh, you know, our sympathy, condolences for this uh, unprecedented uh, human cost, and we'll come back to that. So we would like to move on from, so to speak, uh, Mother Nature, if you will, to the uh, terrorism uh, aspect. And uh, we would like to uh, introduce now our colleague, uh, Richard Rosson uh, from the U.S. Uh, Department of State. Richard, good to see you again. And um, as many of you know, is the Deputy Director of the Office of Multilateral Affairs in the Bureau of Counterterrorism. He served at State Department at the Bureau of Europe, Eurasian Affairs, and so on. Uh, over the years uh, dealing with uh, various uh, threats, including terrorism, cyber, uh, WMD, and so forth. And um, he worked for years also in different areas related to uh, Central Asia and uh, NATO, OEC, and so forth. And uh, I had the uh, honor and pleasure to interact with him for years as well on some of these issues. Uh, number one, uh, related to uh, NATO, and in fact, if I may just mention one, one of our studies uh, together and our colleagues there on uh, NATO uh, dealing with the regional global security uh, provider and uh, concerns and so on. And um, um, we continue to work on some of these uh, uh, problems. One, one of the major, I think, contribution 
of uh, Richard is uh, developing a NATO counterterrorism uh, reference curriculum uh, for study graduate schools and uh, war colleges and so on. It was uh, published literally last, last year, I think, in the summer. I may also mention that uh, Richard served the American embassies uh, in, uh, in the Balkans and uh, elsewhere. He uh, also had experience in the military, the United States uh, Air Force. And um, I'm, I'm really delighted that he deals with uh, some very critical issues, uh, particularly related to international co cooperation to combat terrorism. So Richard, take over. Thank you, Yona. And can everybody hear me? Is yes, we can hear you. The audio? Check. Thank you. Um, Yona, it's been a great pleasure working with you for a number of years and, and colleagues here today. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, opportunity to speak today. A heartfelt thank you to Yona. Our cooperation goes back, as you said, many years, and I hope it continues for many years into the future. Uh, also, allow me to express today my appreciation to this uh, Timely Events co-sponsors, a uh, well done to all who've helped pull this virtual forum together. Greetings to my fellow panelists and speakers, and a warm welcome to all who are able to join us today. Before uh, I begin, allow me to state that my remarks are considered off the record and the opinions and points expressed herein are really my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the United States government, uh, Department of State, or my current Bureau of uh, Counterterrorism. In my remarks today, I'd like to reflect on how we can all work uh, more collaboratively more collaboratively together to address terrorism-related challenges, uh, particularly within the context of the global health, health crisis we all faced that was so well articulated by, um, uh, by Professor Rita Carwell and uh, uh, Professor Bob Turner as well. Um, thank you for the chance again to speak today. Let me state one fairly obvious point uh, right at the beginning that uh, with more and more people uh, online in the COVID era, internet-based security threats can be uh, exacerbated and even proliferate uh, in these, in certain instances. First, let me talk uh, one topic on the, and that's the issue of racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. Um, and let me talk about the challenges related to, we call it REMV here at the State Department. It's a US government term. Some may refer to it as domestic violent extremism or domestic terrorism, but in the context of the State Department and our interactions with colleagues overseas, we refer to it as REMV or racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. The threats from REMVs are transnational. Uh, with groups and individuals recruiting, radicalizing, and sharing tactical training online and in person. REMVs communicate, recruit, radicalize, fundraise, and share weapon-making instructions transnationally and over the internet, as we mentioned. U.S.-based REMVs communicate uh, with and travel to engage with foreign REMV actors and groups, in our view, REMV threats to the United States and our interests abroad are most likely to come from lone actors who've communicated online with other REMV actors and become motivated or inspired uh, to conduct attacks. The administration, the Biden administration has prioritized our efforts to better understand and map the transnational linkages and connections between REMV groups and individuals. The January 6th assault on the Capitol and the tragic deaths and destructions that occurred underscored what we have long known, and that is that the rise of domestic terrorism, or REMV, is a serious and growing national security threat. The White House is now coordinating an interagency review, which broadly falls into three areas. One, conducting a comprehensive threat assessment with the intelligence community and the FBI, uh, but two, building US, cap U.S. government capabilities, beginning with a, a policy review effort to determine how to better share information about this threat, 
support efforts to prevent radicalization, to disrupt violent extremist, extremist networks, and more. And three, coordinating relevant parts of the federal government to enhance and accelerate our overall efforts to address these threats. The Biden administration has committed to confronting this threat with the necessary resources and resolve and is developing policies and strategies based on facts, on objective and rigorous analysis, and on our respect for constitutionally protected free speech and political activities. Last year, in fact, the State Department designated the Russian Imperial Movement, or RIM, and three of its leaders as specially designated global terrorists. RIM, or Russian Imperial Movement, is a white supremacist group based out of St. Petersburg, Russia, that has trained people to commit terrorist acts. And people are not necessarily from Russia. They're training people online. They're, they're incorporating people into their training uh, facilities in Russia. And there's a lot of uh, cross-border uh, efforts made on behalf of RIM in, in the terrorist space. After the RIM designation, a uh, RIM, uh, so after the RIM designation, we, the State Department, engaged with U.S.-based uh, technology companies uh, and informing them of the designation of RIM. And after this happened, the uh, RIM accounts for several online uh, internet service providers and companies, uh, they closed the RIM accounts and removed content from their platforms. A RIM leader recently told an American journalist that one of the most devastating impacts of the designation of RIM as a uh, SDGT or specially designated global terrorist was that Facebook had shut down its web page and this resulted in the loss of years worth of information and hampering the group's, the group's reach. The RIM designation in 2020 was the first time the United States has actually sanctioned white supremacist terrorists, illustrating how seriously we take RIM as an ongoing uh, counterterrorism concern. Looking back, the United States, in close cooperation with Iraqi and coalition partners, eradicated the so called territorial caliphate in Iraq and Syria. Together with our partners, we've liberated nearly 8 million men, women, and children from ISIS's reign of terror. 4 million displaced Iraqis have returned home, and the former ISIS. Um, uh, Amir Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was removed from the battlefield in, in 2019, while Abu Muhammad al-Masri al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda's worldwide number two, was eliminated last year. We know, however, that ISIS, its affiliates, and supporters see these losses as setbacks, not defeat. Battle-hardened terrorists are heading home or, we or wreaking havoc in third countries, and ISIS is adapting to survive, which puts greatest, greater premium on our use of non-military military tools to counter the groups in areas outside of Iraq and Syria. And while the world has focused on ISIS, Al-Qaeda has quietly rebuilt its capabilities and is seeking to reestablish itself as the vanguard of, global, of the global jihadist movement. Today, AQ, or Al-Qaeda, relies on an international network that rivals ISIS in its geographic scope, capability, and intent. Like ISIS, AQ maintains affiliates in countries throughout Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. With law enforcement increasingly at the forefront of our global fight against terrorism, to effectively counter these evolving threats, national authorities need to employ modern tools and devote sufficient resources to prevent terrorist travel and successfully prosecute terrorists and terrorism-related acts. So let me now talk about another topic, and that is under the overall uh, topic uh, or, or issue set of preventing terrorist travel. Improving information sharing is critical for countering terrorist travel and strengthening border controls at ports of entry. Terrorists continued manipulation of the travel sector is what motivated the adoption of UN or United Nations Security Council Resolution 2396, a landmark resolution adopted in 2017 that focuses on preventing terrorist travel. UNSCR 2396 requires states to develop and use watch lists, expand efforts to share information both within governments and with foreign partners to collect and use biometrics, 
and collect and analyze traveler data, including API and PNR or advanced passenger information and PNR passenger name records. By implementing this resolution, UNSCR 2396, we can help prevent terrorists from reaching our shores and stop them from launching attacks against our citizens. As I work on multilateral issues, as, as, Noda, as Yona noted recently, I'd like to highlight the, the fact that Interpol or the International Criminal Police Organization has important tools to counter terrorism. Specifically, UNSCR 2396 calls upon member states to contribute and make use of Interpol's databases. The United States is the largest contributor of foreign terrorist fighter or FTF data to Interpol. In addition, the United States has been working to get countries um, uh, working to get countries' borders connected to Interpol's so-called I-24-7 network, I-24-7 being uh, a secure communication system that provides uh, Interpol member states access to Interpol's databases and services in real time. Enhancing I-24-7 connectivity has been a shared G7 and European Union priority since 2016. The United States helped enhance Interpol connectivity in more than a dozen key partner countries. And in one example, for example, with our partner Indonesia, we connected the 44 most traveled international airports, sea ports, and land ports of entry to I-24-7, Interpol's network, enabling the uh, Indonesian Customs and Excise Directorate General to screen approximately 99% of all international passenger traffic against Interpol databases, a significant success. Moreover, to integrate Interpol's data, disparate data sets and enable more sophisticated analysis, the State Department funded something called Project Insight. And Project Insight is an upgraded digital platform, a di in other words, a digital analytical platform that will enable uh, Interpol analysts and Interpol law enforcement member state uh, representatives to quickly qu query Interpol's databases and criminal analysis files, perform link and trend analysis, and ultimately provide comprehensive investigative assistance on transnational crime and terrorism cases. Let me now shift to um, a new topic, another topic promoting Success, successful prosecutions, in other, in other words, uh, criminal proceedings and law enforcement finishes to terrorism cases. We also need to make sure that once uh, terrorists are detained, they are held accountable for their actions. We are working to help ensure that law enforcement and prosecutors have the necessary authorities, tools, and resources to investigate and prosecute terrorist offenses in national courts. Information sharing a topic I work almost daily on, it is critical to bring investigative information and evidence from conflict areas to countries of origin to support the repatriation and appropriate prosecution of alleged, alleged terrorists and FDFs. As you're all aware, the Syrian Democratic Forces captured thousands, thousands of FDFs or foreign terrorist fighters as they liberated ter territory in Syria and Iraq and put an end to ISIS's so-called caliphate. Having won a decisive victory on the battlefield, the international community now needs to act swiftly to ensure that these facilities and camps where the FTFs uh, and their family members are currently being held do not become incubators for ISIS 2.0. The United States is leading by example, and we have repatriated our own citizens, bringing criminal cases against those who can be prosecuted to date. We've repatriated 12 adult American citizens and 16 U.S. minors from Syria and Iraq. We've also helped over a dozen countries repatriate roughly 800 of their own citizens, both fighters and family members. And we've supported these countries by building the capabilities they need to rehabilitate and reintegrate returning family members. Let me share with you a prosecutorial success story that helps illustrate how material collected by military so-called battlefield evidence can be employed to build successful criminal cases in civilian courts, even many years after the data was 
first obtained and collected. Anas Ab Abid Sadar was a member of a bomb-making cell in Iraq in 2007. Two months after an attack in which an IED he built killed an American soldier, he entered the UK via Syria. UK border control took his fingerprints at Heathrow Airport. Meanwhile, a US military unit had recovered the components from that IED and several other attacks, sending them on to the FBI for processing seven years later. Sardar's fingerprints were found on two of those bombs and a UK court sentenced him, Sardar, to 38 years in prison on murder and conspiracy to commit murder charges. Interpol also plays a key role in supporting enhanced terrorist investigations and prosecutions. With coordination and assistance from the Department of Justice's U.S. National Central Bureau for Interpol, the United States has shared information collected by coalition forces in Iraq and Syria via I-24-7, that's Interpol's uh, secure network, to help foreign law enforcement partners identify known or suspected terrorist activity. The resulting flow of information on FTFs and their activities, support networks, travel routes, and demographics has contributed to numerous successful counterterrorism investigations throughout Europe and North Africa. Targeted information sharing is a crucial brick in the line of defense against terrorist travel and helps also to strengthen investigations and prosecutions. In conclusion then, let me just say that in our current volatile terrorist environment where there, where there are no JV terrorists nor geographical limits to terrorism, we must remain vigilant to new risks and hazards. Today, we spoke of terrorist challenges related to the REMT, REMV threat and global jihadist, jihadist terrorist organizations such as ISIS and AQ. And I briefly touched upon our recent policy priorities and action-oriented responses to these global threats. As the world is rightly focused on grappling with the COVID pandemic, this necessarily has resource impact implications for addressing key security concerns. The call here today is for us all to work together to closely engage and to collectively address the most pressing and rapidly metastasizing terrorist challenges. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Donna. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for this uh, overview. And it is uh, obviously encouraging uh, to see that uh, now the uh, president actually visited uh, the State Department in order to inspire the diplomats to re-engage. And uh, also just the past week, this uh, Munich security uh, conference, I think the message uh, was uh, loud and clear to support again international cooperation uh, to deal with uh, many of the challenges and the next uh, threats that we're going to face. So thank you again, uh, Richard, for uh, trying to provide a mini course to what's happening now on this level. In connection uh, with that, I, I would like to invite our colleague, Charlie Ray, we saw you there before, I think. No, before actually, Charlie Ray, I think uh, we have Guy Roberts. Uh, Guy Roberts, um, who is going to discuss some of his uh, experiences uh, relating to his work in public uh, policy, foreign affairs, international uh, organizations, and so on. Uh, most recently, as many of you know, he was uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense uh, Programs. And uh, we had the uh, honor to participate in many of these uh, activities with him, academic and uh, professional, for many uh, decades. I, I'd like to uh, also mention that he contributed from the uh, academic point of view to our many studies, uh, for example, this WMD uh, reports and uh, so forth. And um, he had also a very extensive experience 
in the field of law, in the world of law, not only in the government, but in uh, various academic environments in terms of teaching and publishing. So uh, welcome, Guy, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Yona. Can everybody hear me all right? I can hear you, Guy. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it is indeed a pleasure once again, Yona, to participate in one of these very useful uh, events um, with some very distinguished, uh, uh, I feel honored to be a part of this group um, and a pleasure to see many of old faces again. I, I, uh, th th there's a big tendency to reminisce and go back many years, especially when you live down in Florida where I think almost everybody here is retired or semi-retired. And, um, and so being that part of that group, I guess I should talk to you also about my medical conditions for about 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but um, I, it, I, the reason I bring that up though, I think is a, an important since I've been here a year now. And um, I have to say that way people view things and what we expect, our expectations about things is a big difference from the way I looked at things when I was living inside the Beltway in the Washington DC area. Um, and a lot of the things that we adapt as policies or uh, think are good ideas don't necessarily translate as well um, or the money that is needed to do those things is not uh, available uh, for one reason or another. And, and again, no better example is uh, the COVID pandemic that we've seen where the infrastructure, and I'd like to talk about that in a minute because I think it, it's uh, very telling uh, was absolutely not in place to deal with something of such catastrophic proportions. Uh, we have over 31,000 de dead from the virus uh, here in Florida, and over 2 million people have been tested positive, um, and that number seems to be continuing to grow. Um, uh, but the good news is we do have a vaccine and, and things, and, and I was vaccinated, uh, so I'll get my second shot in March. So that's all I'll say about my medical condition for now. But I do, uh, because of the pandemic, I think it's important to focus uh, a bit on the one thing that I've always felt has been uh, uh, just as big a threat as a nuclear attack, and that is a, a bio attack of uh, proportions that would rise to the level of a pandemic. And uh, and certainly we've already seen, Bob's mentioned it, uh, um, uh, the uh, economic terms of how uh, incredibly expensive and costly uh, a pandemic like this would be. Uh, again, I can't help but reflect back to when I was in the Bush administration in 2005 and President Bush proposed a response to the threat of a pandemic um, and suggested uh, and proposed many of the things that need to be done uh, that uh, Congress refused to fund. And, uh, and I can't help but think that if in fact we had spent the money to do all of those things and, uh, in those areas uh, that we would have been in a much better position than we find ourselves today. And uh, because of the all too evident economic and social disaster that uh, the COVID has uh, brought we certainly uh, have increased the risk of a bioterror as terrorists have observed uh, how severely the democracies, particularly the democracies in the West have been affected uh, by, um, by, by this virus. Um, it's not just, again, uh, we've done, I think very well. In fact, I think Rita, you'd agree it's almost a miracle that uh, we were able to develop a vaccine in less than a year. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's just, uh, that's tremendous. Um, and it shows you what we can do, in fact, uh, when we're faced with those kinds of, of threats. But um, again, it's just not the, uh, when you look at what we've seen here, not just the reappearance or appearance of Corona and influenza viruses uh, and their mutations that we need to fear. It's also, the vulnerability that that has demonstrated uh, by in the United States and our allies uh, to something like the uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, developed democratic countries are the principal target of um, terrorist groups. 
And uh, unlike the difficulty in obtaining uh, uranium-235 or plutonium to make nuclear weapons, we have revolutionary new technologies uh, like CRISPR, which um, for the uninitiated is called Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, that uh, this technology lessens the threshold for terrorist acquisition of bioweapons. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I think it's quite obvious we're in the midst of a re revolutionary period in the life sciences. And while they are beneficial and it's amazing technologies, there is growing risk that the same science will be um, deliberately misused and the consequences could be absolutely catastrophic. These new gene editing tools widely and cheaply available to anyone that might be used to produce biological weapons of unfathomable destruction. We know that ISIS and other terror groups have acquired and experimented with materials to create biological weapons. Um, additionally, we, authoritarian regimes, uh, some of whom are known to have biological and weapon programs uh, may believe that they are comparatively less vulnerable or they don't care about their populations when it comes to bioweapons and therefore making uh, them less risk to their uh, youth development and use. Uh, so uh, when we think about these things and we look at all of the areas that we needed to address, uh, I would like to propose that one of the ways that we can actually make ourselves less vulnerable to bio attacks and future pandemics is to have almost a Manhattan-like project uh, to address the vulnerabilities. Now, there are at least nine areas in biodefense capabilities for whatever uh, type of attack or threat we face, whether it's a naturally occurring pandemic or, in fact, a broad terrorist attack using uh, a, some uh, artificially produced uh, agent or pathogen. Uh, those nine areas uh, we've shown uh, to be lacking in response capabilities. Um, for example, um, early disease detection and monitoring. Um, we have had challenges there. We've gotten better, but more needs to be done. Um, having, a, in that regard, a national surge capability, the ability to rapidly respond in a very short period of time. Um, international cooperation. Uh, international cooperation has been problematic at best. I know when I was at NATO, we tried to establish a virtual stockpile of vaccines and ask countries to virtually produce, and not a single country did. Wouldn't even produce a virtual vaccine capability. And so that's been a challenge. And uh, we've seen the reluctance of countries to share. And of course, that's been a big complaint for lesser developed countries as well. Uh, supply chain management, um, again, um, shown the deficiencies in our ability to rapidly uh, get um, materials and vaccines uh, to our population. The public health system capacity is another area that uh, uh, needs a lot of work um, and uh, should be done, in my view, in a very holistic uh, approach. Vaccine development, um, well, we all know the problems in development. Uh, issues there, and um, medical treat, um, treatment and therapeutics, another area that uh, we uh, need a lot of work in, and uh, finally, public education and communication. Uh, now, all, all those areas are being addressed in more or less in independent ways, in different ways by national, local uh, governments. Uh, I would suggest that we'd, we'd almost need a Manhattan-like project where we had an overarching policy that brought all of those together and we worked to, to make that response capability, that biodefense capability, one where um, terrorists would think twice about trying to, in fact, uh, use a, a weapon that we know would not be effective because we could respond very rapidly uh, to it. The, um, another, area that, uh, I mean, I mentioned that as part of the supply chain management is the vulnerability of our 
uh, logistical support system. And this has been particularly notable uh, in the combination of using chemical or biological agents uh, with a cyber attack. Um, on the 8th of uh, February, and a town right next to Clearwater, where I live, uh, less than 10 miles away, a uh, town called Oldsmeyer, um, on the 8th of February, um, using a remote access program uh, shared by the plant workers, um, a hacker breached the system and proceeded uh, to dump uh, sodium hydroxide in the water supply uh, by a factor of 100, from 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. Uh, sodium hydroxide uh, is used to treat water acidity, but it's found in cleaning supplies such as soaps and drain cleaners, and it can cause irritation, skin burns, and in large quantities, death. Um, now, uh, luckily, after a few hours, one of the workers noticed uh, that somebody had taken over the system and watched as the little mouse arrow moved around and started dumping more and more of these materials into the uh, water system and was able to intercept it. But uh, we now see that these, uh, and more and more, we have these remote access uh, systems that are very, very vulnerable. And uh, it's very easy for hackers uh, because of um, the uh, underfunded local government infrastructure uh, to, in fact, uh, take over these things. And we've seen these in the past. So remote access to industrial control systems, such as those running water treatment plants, have become increasingly common. Um, in fact, um, uh, the... Um, We've seen Russian-backed hackers uh, that have in recent years uh, penetrated some US industrial control systems, including power grid and manufacturing plants. While Iranian hackers uh, were caught seizing control of the uh, New York Dam in 2013. Um, and uh, we even had a case in um, uh, Israel uh, where at last May, uh, they thwarted a major attack against their water systems where there was an attempt to dump uh, huge amounts of chlorine in uh, the water and other chemicals. Uh, they were able to stop that and that was attributed to Iran. Um, the, um, and and the, what was interesting about what happened in Oldsmar here was that in the debate, uh, they the company that ran the remote access system said, well, we put in place um, controls to make sure that won't happen again. But uh, they did a survey of the other towns around the area and discovered that all of them had similar vulnerabilities. And when you look at the whole food chain, if you will, uh, and especially local and state governments, it's uh, very evident that there's a lack of resources to institute the safeguards or protections uh, to make them less vulnerable. Um, there just isn't the resources to do that. And there's not the political will to do that. So um, even though we have good policies set by uh, the national government with, uh, for example, the national strategy to combat bioterrorism that was published in 2018 um, and a number of these proposals, it's very difficult to get Congress to uh, fund many of these uh, policy issue, policies, and it's even more difficult um, for uh, states and local governments to uh, implement them as well. Uh, but this is a good example where uh, the, that points out the vulnerabilities of uh, local systems uh, and attacks uh, using uh, uh, chemicals or biological agents, uh, both from the cyber standpoint as well as the material standpoint. Um, I think I'll uh, stop with that, uh, Yona, and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions or comments from, um, from any of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. Of course, we'll, we'll get, uh, you know, back Back to you, you covered the wide range of uh, issues. Uh, obviously, we can spend a long time 
uh, to see what else uh, can we do to recognize, uh, for example, the science and uh, technology base and the industrial base and so on, the supply chain that you mentioned um, actually can uh, produce, um, I think, uh, some more cooperation if it is uh, really global, as, as we know. So we'll come back to some of these uh, issues uh, later on. Thank you again. I want to move on very quickly to our colleague, uh, Ambassador Charlie, Charlie Ray, um, that I, I think um, is a very significant here in this connection uh, in terms of uh, the role uh, of uh, diplomacy as uh, we began to discuss with uh, Richard uh, Prosson. Um, now, Charlie Ray, I just want to mention some highlights. He retired from the United States Foreign Service after 30 years um, of career. And uh, he also spent some 20 years in the US uh, Army, uh, retiring uh, with the rank of uh, Major and uh, he served a number of times in uh, Vietnam and uh, also served in Korea and Germany and elsewhere. Um, his uh, foreign service experience uh, is really broad. Uh, he was posted in China, Thailand, Sierra Leone, Vietnam, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, and so forth. Now, uh, we had the honor to uh, collaborate on the, the role of uh, diplomacy for a number of years, also in cooperation with American Academy uh, of Diplomacy. I, I want to uh, mention some, some of the uh, publications, such as the role of diplomacy in world affairs that we published. I don't know if one can see that, but more importantly, uh, once uh, Ray retired, Charlie Ray, he, uh, be, became actually engaged in uh, writing and publishing. He published more than 200, I think, uh, books of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, his recent uh, book on diplomacy is The Ethical Dilemmas and the Practice of uh, Diplomacy. So uh, we're grateful for his uh, leadership and support of our work. Charlie, please. Uh, thank you, Yona. Uh, you know, on the subject of terrorism, uh, 2020 was a year of mixed blessings. While some international terrorist groups, most notably the Islamic State, were weakened and dispersed, uh, this dispersal has unfortunately made them harder to target, and the return of many Islamic State fighters to their countries of origin has only exacerbated extremist situations in those countries. Al-Qaeda, which was, has also been weakened in the Middle East, has, grain, has gained ground in Africa, as has the Islamic State. Uh, and Al-Qaeda affiliates accounted for nearly half the world's total terrorist incidents in 2020. In the West, uh, the problem we've seen is far-right extremism, which is on the rise with an, more than a 200% increase since 2014. And with far-right extremists, accounting for 82% of deaths that were termed terrorist caused. Uh, in 2021, we're likely to see an increase in extremism and terrorist acts with Islamic State and Al-Qaeda affiliates committing acts abroad and domestic extremists, primarily right-wing groups in the West. Uh, in the US, our political divisiveness, dissatisfaction with the results of the 2020 election and COVID-related issues is likely to fuel anger and provide pretexts for groups from the right and the left to commit acts of violence. We've already seen such an act with the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol by right-wing groups. And on January 27th this year, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued a bulletin stating that we can expect more such activity uh, in the coming year. Looking back at the year 2020, the Islamic State began the year 
in a weakened condition, having lost all the territory previously controlled. Many of their fighters return to their countries of origin, which unfortunately adds to the volatile mixes already there. And the dispersal ha has made uh, Islamic State fighters much harder to target. Al-Qaeda, while it was significantly weakened in the Middle East, has gained ground in Africa, including West Africa, North Africa, and the Horn. Uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates, such as Al-Shabaab in Somalia, accounted for nearly half the world's total terrorist incidents in 2020. Uh, just as an example, on January 9th, 2020, uh, in an attack on a Niger uh, Nigerian military outpost in the country of Niger, an Islamic State associated group killed 79 people and injured several others. And on January 18th of that same year, an Al Qaeda affiliate staged a suicide car bomb attack uh, in Somalia. Attacks by extremist groups in the West also increased in 2020. Uh, the far right far right and white supremacist groups accounted for the greatest number of attacks and fatalities in 2020 and into 2021. With the exception of the September 11, 2001 attacks, which caused the greatest number of fatalities in a single incident, far right groups such as the Boogaloo Boys, QAnon, the Proud Boys, and the Three Percenters Movement accounted for the largest number of attacks and casualties in the United States in 2019 and 2020. Far left and anti-fascist groups also carried out violent attacks, but in 2020 accounted for only 20% of such attacks as compared to 41% by far right groups. And what's ahead for us this year? According to some experts, extremist and terrorist activity is likely to increase in 2021, particularly in the West and in the United States. While religion, political polarization, and economic inequities fuel many extremist movements, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are also positive factors that will provide pretext for many of these groups to engage in violence. In the US, for example, Anger over the outcome of the 2020 election caused by the false narrative of a stolen election continue to, in, to motivate many of the far right group as do opposition to COVID related restrictions such as mask wearing and the closure of non-essential businesses. This is not to say that international terrorist groups will not continue to be of concern, but the events of January 6th when a mob stormed the U.S. Capitol, it brought home the realization that domestic terrorism also impacts us here in the United States. In fact, according to the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, domestic groups currently represent a greater threat to U.S. security than do international groups. Despite rosy pronouncements from the previous administration and the best efforts of the current one, we've still not truly turned the corner on the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and even when we finally reached a point when infections, hospitalizations, and deaths have declined to, and I, I shudder at saying this, manageable levels, we'll still face a long period of economic recovery. The threat of violence, therefore, is likely to be with us for a while. There are a number of things I think we can do to deal with this situation. For starters, Politicians at all levels should lower the temperature of partisan rhetoric and bickering and encourage their followers and constituents to do the same. Media outlets and social media companies need to do more in monitoring and limiting the spread of disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. And finally, the public needs to exercise better judgment in the intake of information, learning how to distinguish between fact and fiction. Extremism is not likely to disappear, even if we do all of this, but if we don't, it will become an even larger problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, also, recommendations. Uh, uh, obviously, we will continue to uh, engage uh, in terms of uh, thoughtful uh, 
and fresh uh, new new ideas and so on. Um, and uh, we need maybe to develop some sort of uh, slogans uh, uh, with uh, some meaningful, I, I think, uh, resources to return to normalcy and uh, to, to turn the corner. So it's not going to be simple, but perhaps we can learn from the lessons of, of the past, what worked, what did not. Now I would like to move on to our commentators, uh, colleagues, uh, to make uh, some comments or to uh, brief us on some of the concerns that they have in connection with our topic today. Uh, our first commentator is Professor Nati Carpitano uh, Santa Maria from uh, Spain, from uh, Madrid. She is a professor uh, in the Department of Energy Engineering at the Polytechnic University in Madrid. And uh, she also um, the General Secretary of the Institute of Fusion uh, Nuclear uh, in memory of, of Professor General uh, Velardi and is a member of the Presidium of the European Academy of Sciences. So she spent uh, many, many years uh, dealing with some of these uh, issues, the energy, but also related to transnational crime, security, terrorism, and, and so forth. And uh, she published uh, widely and represents the Spanish government at uh, different meetings related to the International Atomic Energy Agency. So welcome uh, from Spain, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, good, good evening here. And uh, very nice to, to see you all of you. And to a special thanks to Professor Alexander, uh, to who I, I know for many, many years ago. And it's a privilege for me to be here among you and to share these uh, this reflections or, or, or this uh, important debate in these important moments. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to comment on what you have said, although I, I agree in, in a high percentage of, of your, your testimony. And I would like to, Churchen, I have prepared a small presentation on uh, new paradigms in nuclear security threats in the 21st century. Uh, Dr. Roberts has been talking about the problem of, uh, and some of you as well, of the nuclear uh, terrorism. And I would like to talk briefly about this, uh, this, uh, this topic. And next, please. Well, briefly, we have to face new paradigms in nuclear security. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important as uh, to enhance uh, radiological uh, security uh, culture in, in society. Uh, the more prepared is a society to face uh, a challenge, the, 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 the better way to solve part of this problem, of this challenge. Afterwards, we have to take into consideration technological advances and uh, insider threats. Insider threats has been taken into consideration in the last years, especially due to uh, the, the, the new uh, enhancement of, of new technologies. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of illicit trafficking, radioactive and nuclear materials, vulnerabilities depending on security control of other countries and cyber threats as you have been pointing out before and artificial intelligence and especially the role of multinational networks. Of course, uh, we have to, 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 to take into the consideration that we have some counter counteracting measures to this. We've got to transmit to society a responsible knowledge on radiological issues. We have to state 
Thank you very much. A proactive communication policy, not to improvise, just to prepare a good proactive and good communication policy to the public. And another thing which is very important in my point of view, as the frequent asked questions in those institutional websites responsible of radiation protection and response uh, in radiological emergencies, information how on minimizing the effects of radiation, dirty bombs, or the use of panic as a weapon, as we have seen along this 21st century. Please, next slide. Uh, we will talk, uh, this, the next slide is not uh, before to cover. All right, let's, uh, okay, let's talk a little bit of uh, this problem of illegal trafficking of radioactive and nuclear materials or agents. Uh, of course, uh, we have to know that covert acquisition of dual use materials, both tangible and intangible, through illicit trafficking is produced by applying a series of techniques and a strategy that are becoming increasingly sophisticated. Combating illicit trafficking or radioactive or nuclear materials is an arduous task due to the opacity of these camouflage operations, indirect transmissions, diversification of suppliers, etc. Uh, the development of new technologies for transport and communication of goods via cyberspace not only substantially facilitates the flow of RN trade, illegal trade, but also enhances security for traffickers. I think we can apply in some way these two biological and to chemical agents as well. In some way, if we are talking of illicit trafficking with different, uh, with different connotations, but the root is there. Please, next slide. Mm, so, in, in, when we talk of criminology, we can find three, three, there's three different ways of transmitting this illegal trafficking. Traffickers will falsify the end user naturally. A key factor in illicit trafficking is the falsification of the concept for which RN materials will be used. We cannot forget that we are dealing with dual use materials with dual use technologies. Therefore, this is easier to camouflage uh, for, 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 for illegal dealers. Or RN materials trafficking may occur in different moments. Uh, first of all, by transporting them through countries where there is not strong demand for export control. We know that there are certain countries still under development that have a lot of porous uh, frontiers or they don't have strong regulations when talking of import of export uh, items. Please, next slide. Well, uh, for this reason, due to the fact that from 1993, 1992, 1993, the number of illicit traffic and radioactive materials were very big very high, were increasingly high. Therefore, the International Atomic Energy Agency decided to establish a ITD Bay, uh, uh, is an international trafficking database that uh, it is made by the reports of the 139 member parties party members that belong to the to this uh, or institution, which, as you know, depend directly from the United Nations. Uh, all the information which is included in this list is, uh, is authoritative information given by the state members and is divided into three groups. Group one refers to trafficking or malicious use, group two, undetermined intent, and group three, non-connected with malicious use. If we see the next slide, please we will see that uh, uh, incidents related with malicious use from 1993 up to 2019, we have uh, down the different years, and we have seen that they were a, a, a very, very high number of these incidents for malicious use, mainly in the middle of the 20, in 2005, 2006, 2008, and so on. And fortunately, although the amount is still big, the, the number of incidents is still big, we can see that they have been reduced, uh, not, not <coughs> gradually, but in some way. Please, next slide. And we could say with figures that uh, in the period, uh, yes? Yes? No, no, nothing, it's okay. Thank you. 
So we can see that 219 incidents related to trafficking or malicious use were taken in, in 2,317 incidents not related to trafficking or malicious use, and 1,023 incidents along the 2019 year only, okay, related to trafficking, not related, or with sufficient information to relate with this. Uh, the radioisotopes more used in this uh, in this trafficking were the ones uh, devoted for industry, for mining, and for medical uses. Uh, being iridium 192, uh, cesium 137, and americium 241. Let me tell you that this is is very delicate uh, problem. Is very delicate problem in under social point of view, under law enforcement points of view, is a very delicate and grave problem. Let's go, please, with the next uh, slide. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, to combat or to counteract this uh, trafficking, the International Atomic Energy Agency launched a special mobile application, especially for uh, uh, coordinated and um, for frontline officers that are working in the first line network in 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 frontiers. These uh, these uh, these devices discriminate what we can call uh, radioisotope for 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 commercial or industrial application uh, and radioisotopes which might 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 be not used for for good purposes. Uh, I think. Um, Next slide. Uh, general features of radio of radioactive and not a nuclear material smuggling. Basically, a high economic estimation of the products. People think that they will be uh, a higher value uh, in the black market. No fixed buyer, but supply driven. Uh, it is not. Uh, I'm not going to find. Uh, uh, buyers at random, usually something which is uh, specially looked for specifically. We have very porous and poor control cross borders, and uh, in several cases, uh, this smuggling are for commercial purposes to to use the uh, the metals which involve and shield the radioactive sources. But in other cases, the reasons have not been clearly identified. Uh, the last point in radioactive smuggling is that this unstable market that can coexist absolutely with other kind types of smuggling. We can talk of human beings smuggling, of human beings street or drugs or and so on. And uh, the risk assessment, the last one, please, I think. Yeah, the previous one, please, is important. Yeah, uh, as risk assessment, I has always emphasized the words made by former uh, general director, uh, Professor Yukiya Amayo, Amano, of the International Atomic Energy Agency, that says exactly that the fact that have uh, that that there hasn't been never a major terrorist attack involving nuclear or radioactive material should not blind us to the severity of the threat. This is my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, Yonaha, Professor Alexander, thank you very much for your kind invitation to this very interesting meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nati, for your presentation. As I mentioned, we are going to incorporate uh, your slides, if you wish, in uh, our report and uh, any further, I think, um, insights that you may have. Now I want to move on to our next colleague, Dr. Milton uh, Onig, who um, is a physicist, nuclear physicist. So I think it would be interesting to hear from him uh, his focus particularly related to Iran. Uh, for transparency, I, I must uh, say that uh, Milton and I uh, collaborated uh, for decades on uh, the nuclear threats and um, academically we try to conduct uh, research, publish a few books in this uh, area also related to, to Iran and so forth. And um, I, I asked him to, to follow your presentation and see 
uh, what are some of the lessons related to the Iranian case now? Milton? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and especially with this very distinguished group of people. Um, I'm going to talk about Iran, as Jonas said, and um, they call it a Mexican standoff. That is between U.S. and Iran. Each side says the other must take the first step toward returning to the provisions of the JCPOA, our Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the 2015 nuclear agreement between Iran and the P5 plus one countries, including the United States, China, and four European nations, prevent Iran from making nuclear weapons. The deal puts limits on Iran's enriched uranium stockpile and centrifuge enrichment technology for 15 years. By then, the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors are to gain permanent access to all of Iran's nuclear facilities to ascertain they are only for civilian use. But in May 2018, 2018, the Trump administration withdrew the U.S. from the nuclear agreement and imposed crippling sanctions on Iran in a campaign of massive pressure. In response, Iran violated the JCPOA in many ways, particularly by increasing its stockpile of low enriched uranium gas eightfold. Thus, at the present time, Iran can further enrich its stockpile to enough weapons grade uranium for a bomb in about three months, rather than taking a year as was the situation before. But, but according to the recent report of Israel military intelligence, it would take two years from now for Iran to fabricate an actual nuclear weapon. Last Sunday, Iran announced that it would give the US and Europe a three month window for a new diplomatic effort to restore the 2015 nuclear agreement. If not successful, then Iran would sharply limit i.e. inspections to its nuclear sites. Who takes the lead? A move back into the nuclear deal can be done simultaneously. That is the easy part. Iran would want the U.S. to drop the deliberate and debilitating sanctions imposed by Trump. Biden may wish to do this more gradually. Ultimately, President Biden will want to broaden the scope of the program beyond the current nuclear deal. This must be worked out with Iran and other countries, something that is not certain at this time. An important factor in the outcome of Iran's is the outcome of Iran's June presidential election. Secretary of State Blinken, in his January Senate confirmation hearing, clearly stated that the intention of the Biden administration first consult with its allies, including Israel and Gulf states, before embarking on negotiating such a long and stronger new agreement. Perhaps it might include putting long-term limits on Iran's union uranium enrichment and fuel reprocessing, even like the gold standard adopted in the United Arab Emirates for its civil nuclear power program that completely disavows in-country enrichment and fuel reprocessing. Biden wants a long-term agreement among a wide range of partners that places emphasis on regional security and stability. It would ensure that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. It would limit Iran's terrorist proxies, particularly Hezbollah, and restrict Iran's ballistic missile program. But negotiating a new agreement would give Iran a new regional role. Maybe then, the environment will be conducive to pursuing a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone. The question is how to talk Iran into joining the whole effort. Thank you. Very much, uh, Milton, for this uh, assessment. Uh, obviously, we can spend uh, a long time to discuss the other Iranian challenges. You touched upon the terrorism uh, aspect, for example, all the way from violations of uh, human rights and uh, as well as uh, regional 
and global destabilization, but we would come back to it a little bit later on. I want to move on in the uh, interest uh, of time to our next commentator. And uh, it is indeed a great uh, honor and pleasure to invite again uh, Ambassador Simonovic, who is the ambassador of Croatia in the United States. Uh, we had the honor to host him for a number of years at our sessions, particularly uh, last year. And uh, basically, I want to mention that he was educated uh, in some other related areas of literature and Italian and so forth. And he obtained also his master's degree at King's College in London. Uh, what is uh, very interesting that he had a very wide experience in the diplomatic corps. He served, for example, in Paris and the ambassador of Croatia in Israel and so forth. Now, uh, what is uh, very relevant to our discussion is that um, he participated, as I mentioned, in our discussions last year, and it is relevant simply because Croatia held the presidency of the Council of the European Union uh, last year, in the beginning of the year, and uh, I think it would be useful to get uh, his assessment of what that happened within the context of Europe. Ambassador? Thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Dear Yona. Uh, uh, greetings to um, all our distinguished speakers. It's always a really a distinct pleasure and, and privilege uh, uh, taking part uh, 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 of, uh, of, of, of discussions within such a distinguished circle. Uh, what I would like to do very briefly, uh, as succinctly as possible, is to uh, kind of maybe summarize what has been said and the, uh, what I, I would like to do that to, to develop uh, my, my short commentary uh, uh, along three, um, three uh, main areas of, of topics, three main clusters, if you wish. The first one being uh, 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 stock taking uh, uh, pandemic wise to uh, take a short look into uh, where we think we are. The second one was, would be uh, uh, taking a look at the uh, main threats horizon. What, 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 what in, a, in, a, in a foreseeable sense uh, we can see um, uh, the, the future has in stock for us. And the uh, third cluster uh, may be the um, uh, kind of a preliminary lessons learned to see if we have learned something and the uh, pinpoint some of the main main strengths and main main uh, main elements for the uh, for the uh, planning our policy, planning our responses. Uh, starting with the with the stock taking, I, I think using the um, the um, intelligence gradation, I would say that we uh, we are most likely pandemic wise most likely likely scenario is that we are having it under control gradually. That's what we have can see now. That's what we can realistically predict. There may be os oscillations one way or another. Um, the uh, vaccine has been introduced massively, at least in the developed world. And the, uh, the, 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 the highest li uh, mm -hmm. likelihood for the uh, foreseeable future would be that we will be having it under control, getting it back, get back to a kind of normal, um, not uh, getting rid of the virus entirely, but learning how to live with it, how learning how to manage it, uh, uh, having it uh, not so... Uh, making it not having such a, a disturbing effect uh, and the uh, maleficent co consequences on our life and on the and on life human life and the human all, all human activity but having said that i would say that it's necessarily to to uh, issue to um, also to uh, issue a bit of a warning that it is possible also to face other scenarios uh, scenarios in which we will be having ups and downs we will have to deal with the different strains, the strains which will be more virulent, strains which we, they may 
demonstrate themselves to be more more resistant. This is this is a this is a, indeed a possibility, and I guess at this moment the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, it's hard to it's hard truly to say what will, what what will be the 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 uh, the, the outcome. Uh, prudent planning would be to prepare for any kind of uh, contingency. But again, having said all that, I think that the most likely scenario is to uh, to having to have it under control, to back into a, to get get back into a kind of normalcy, and uh, uh, as much as the uh, the global economy is concerned, uh, where the main actors are concerned, U.S., Europe, developed world, we are to we will be to a likelihood, uh, as much as we can tell now, we'll be seeing. Um, Kind of V-shaped recovery. It may be. Uh, it may be. Uh, in some instances, it may be steep. In some instances, it may be less steep. But the the uh, 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 forecast in a, in an economic sense and in a uh, in a pandemic sense uh, finally may not be that 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 gloomy after all. The second thing is uh, uh, while uh, the uh, taking having having this in mind. To look into the how the uh, the uh, main main threats uh, horizon looks like for all of us, uh, I, I would say it, 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 it's very much about terrorism. The terrorism may have not been the, certainly it has been overshadowed by the by the uh, larger global threat, which was the pandemic, and it has been overshadowed by something else, which has been existing, which had been existing before. But the uh, the existence of, of of a trend has certainly been reinforced during the pandemic, and that is the uh, the uh, the, the uh, return to interstate interstate uh, uh, confrontation. Uh, 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 we are back into a, a, a great power uh, again, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, much more than that has been the case, let's say, a decade or two decades ago. Uh, with with everything in it, it entails for the for the defense planners for the uh, for the type of military technology we are using type of intelligence capabilities we are developing and activities we are pursuing uh, uh, and indeed the uh, the magnitude of threats we are, we are facing uh, 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 terrorism has the the, the the causes and the effects of terrorism have been there all the time uh, the the, uh, the despite the fact that the uh, in a territorial sense the ISIS has been very very much defeated, uh, 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 Al Qaeda is is back uh, uh, alive and kicking. Uh, we don't know what will be happening with Afghanistan, with the agreement or with no agreement with the uh, with the Taliban's uh, playing playing their game with the uh, with the Western forces uh, uh, under the U.S. leadership, uh, not only contemplating but very much uh, being in the uh, an exit mode. What what effects would that have to the uh, to, to Afghanistan and to the uh, Afghanistan becoming or not becoming a safe haven for terrorists again remains to be seen, but it certainly remains to be observed. So the 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 uh, uh, in terms of the uh, 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 main national security threats we are facing, the uh, we certainly see the resurgence of the uh, the uh, uh, interstate confrontation, great power confrontation. With the terrorism not not disappearing from the from the horizon, but still being very much very much with us. Uh, 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 also uh, uh, evolving in a sense of using new technologies of being very much present on the internet, and the uh, the uh, which will which brings me to the third cluster. Uh, um, uh, to all likelihood, uh, considering. Uh, exploiting the uh, the uh, vulnerabilities uh, which have been brutally exposed by global or a national vulnerabilities which have been brutally exposed by the pandemic. That brings me to the final my final final third cluster, which is the uh, the the uh, consequences, the effects, uh, the the and the uh, the. Uh, adequate lessons learned we may uh, we may uh, deduce from them of the what of what was happening in terms of in, for uh, as much as the pandemic is concerned but also all other trends exposed and the uh, brought by the by the pandemic so it, it has been a it, it has been a stress test for the for the uh, scientific community 
for the national security community, for the individual country, national states, for the international organizations. And the, some act, actors responded better, some actors responded not so, not so good. Uh, every, it's up to everybody to draw adequate conclusions. But the, uh, 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 what, what I can, I can uh, uh, assess from my part is certainly that the, a lot of vulnerabilities have been exposed. Vulnerabilities in, in a sense of, to begin with, with the uh, uh, production, manufacturing, supply chains we, have, we, we, have, we have been having before. And now we uh, need to shorten them to make them more reliable, to make them, to make them uh, um, uh, uh, credible and the uh, sustainable, the meaning uh, not only going, going national, but the, uh, keeping them among friends, among allies. So, so there has certainly been a shift towards the, uh, the uh, strategic, strategic, not, not self-sufficiency, but strategic autonomy, what we call it in Europe. And this is applicable to the to, to, to the United States and to many other Western countries, uh, and that, that the uh, the fact that uh, also the uh, and the pandemic, needless to say, uh, has exposed so much the how vulnerable we are to the uh, to the uh, actions of Mother Nature, st stemming in this case also from our, our intrusions into the wild, our our playing tricks with the, with the Mother Nature, uh, and the Mother Nature responding. In kind uh, uh, that brings us to the to the uh, uh, that certainly sharpens the the threat of other human actions upon the nature climate 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 changes certainly being uh, on, on top of the list but the uh, there is uh, I, I would say there is and it has been mentioned during the uh, uh, the, by the previous speakers uh, the, uh, the the fact that we are so much that we have been and that we, we remain also so much exposed to the, um, uh, so much vulnerable and open uh, f uh, to the uh, the uh, bio 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 biohazards, uh, pandemic being one of them, it has certainly uh, 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 injected uh, a set of. Ideas. We, we have to start from that assumption, a set of um, uh, 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 malevolent ideas uh, uh, to the malevolent actors, terrorists. Uh, being the uh, lone lone wolves or the uh, uh, the uh, major terrorist organizations, uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, the uh, what to, what to do next. So the um, I would certainly uh, one of the lessons learned, I, I think, needs to be taken is the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, seriousness and deadliness of the uh, biohazard. Uh, um, in this case, not uh, not uh, uh, developed and employed by the by the mother nature by by the uh, by the, by the um, a level in human actors. Uh, the, the, the second thing, is, and my final topic is, and it has also been very uh, eloquently elaborated during the, uh, the, uh, this, this webinar, is the fact that the whole stress of the pandemic, um, the, all the stress uh, put on our societies, put on, our inter put on the international community, put on the, uh, the, 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 the states, the instruments of states and the instruments of international organizations has uh, 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 brought more to the surface the, uh, the uh, uh, trends of social and political radicalization. Uh, 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 not only in any particular country, in some particular, in some particular countries more than, than others, but this is, uh, I, I would say, this is very much a, a global, a global, global trend. Let me quote the, uh, a, a, a study I recently read. I think it was in, in Foreign Affairs when the analyst was using the term, and it is, it is, it it, it, it would sound certainly very, very disturbing to, uh, to the, uh, to the scientists. And here, indeed, we have a, we have a circle of, of, uh, of distinguished scientists that we almost like live in an age of unreason. The Enlightenment and the uh, the trend started with the, the, the Enlightenment being the age of reason and the triumph of science. Now we have a we have almost the uh, I wouldn't say a triumph. We shouldn't be giving it up uh, uh, of 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 uh, wild conspiracy theories. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, irrational what to, what, what to us uh, may seem irrational uh, uh, proponents of irrational radical ideas. 
bringing us to the back into the dark back into the middle middle ages into the dark age and we see that brought into the surface we have seen that in some particular countries we can see but the trend is the trend is overall and certainly the trend has been widened deepened and the made certainly more loud uh, made louder by the by the reach of the internet by the everything the internet uh, entails by the, by the social by the social media and the, this is this 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 may uh, this this is this is this has, this has been going beyond uh, uh, purely virtual. Uh, it, it has spilled over into the material sphere. We have seen that, and we will be we are, we should be ready uh, to see more more of that. Which brings us to the uh, to the crucial idea how to deal how to deal with the, uh, the with the uh, uh, hostile. And the uh, uh, not only potentially but actually pr 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 proven uh, very dangerous uh, uh, flow of uh, uh, ideas on the internet, uh, uh, striking a delicate balance between the, the freedom, the individual freedom, the freedom of expression, and the necessity of the society to make sure that the uh, this freedom, somebody else's, uh, somebody's idea of freedom, does not, not does not infringe into the freedom of others. Which is the essence of democracy. So I, I'll stop that. Thank you very much. Hope I have been able to provide a certain maybe a summary of what has been discussed and share with you some of my ideas. Dear Yorna, Professor, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your uh, insights. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I would like to invite our colleagues um, on the program to make uh, any comment or question so we can develop uh, some sort of dialogue. Maybe we'll begin. Is uh, Jen still here? Or oh, she had to leave for another meeting, I guess. I'm, no, I'm here. I was on mute. I apologize. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So if, if you have any uh, suggestions or comments or questions, please. Uh I don't necessarily have any questions to the group, but one thing that I do want to address is um, the threat environment, and everybody commented this, and I've been taking notes the whole time, the threat environment is changing, and that's not news, right? Um, but it means that we need to have new approaches to how we handle these things. Um, and again, this is something that we've had to reevaluate every decade or so. I think now we're getting to a point that we need to reevaluate it faster, right? The disruptive technologies are coming at us and disrupting the way society operates faster than it used to. We see that through in what we were just talking about of information or disinformation campaigns, right? People are able to spread news faster and self-report and social media has hindered anybody's ability to do fact checking like we used to, right? Um, you look at things and you talk about the new threats of the internet infrastructure and supply chain were totally disrupted during the pandemic. Um, the threat of not having internet while everybody's been working from home and not to mention the energy grid and other conditions that, that are ever totally reliant on the internet. But if that went down at the same time, we'd be in a totally different position than we are today. Um, and then one of the existing, uh, or one of the horizon threats that I think that we need to be prepared for. Um, and, and maybe this pandemic caught us a little bit off guard, a lot off guard, um, but the, the incoming flux of biotech and, and medical towards precision medicine, right? And if we're not prepared for the, or thinking about all of the threats that, that might be addressed there um, and the way that people are cared for and the, the way that the technology is developing to an individual and tailored to that um, is something that we need to, to consider. So I think all of you might brought up beautiful points and I certainly wasn't able to capture all of it in my notes. So I'm really happy we were recording and I know that Yona's gonna put out a great report based on the, your comments today. So thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Jen, for, for your uh, insights. Uh, we would like to follow up with uh, our other colleagues uh, who may wish uh, to, to uh, ask a question or make a comment. Uh, Bob Turner, is are you still there? Yes. Well, go ahead if you... I, I think it's been an excellent uh, program. I don't have any particular questions. I've learned a lot. 
It's exactly what I expected from a conference put on by you, Yona. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I probably have questions as I think more about it, but, but right now none come to mind. I just uh, found it a fascinating uh, exchange. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Carwell. Are you there? I don't see. I, no, I'm here. I just um, I really very much enjoyed the discussion. It's, um, it, it, it's really sort of being brought up to speed in a variety of dis disciplines, and it's been splendid. So thank you, Yona. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on now. Uh, Richard Wilson. Thanks, Yona. I would just say it was, it was a very rich uh, discussion from my perspective as well, and I really appreciated the chance to interact with everyone on the panel and the speakers, and uh, look forward to f interacting in future events. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Guy Roberts. Well, I just want to echo what Richard said. Thank you very much, uh, Yona, for putting this on, and that's great to see all the other uh, presenters and speakers and um, the I just uh, I, you know we really do have um, I guess uh, to quote uh, one of uh, uh, President Obama's advisors you know we, we shouldn't let a, a, a calamity go to waste um, the pandemic uh, I think gives us opens a door to doing some really good things to help develop a, a good response uh, a defense capability against uh, uh, these kinds of threats, and uh, I hope we take advantage of it. Um, and I know how difficult it was uh, in the past, um, and uh, there was a, a, a bipartisan lack of uh, interest in, in doing the things that need to be done, and, and now I hope that we have a bipartisan support for doing the things that we need to do. So, um, And I think we've uh, furthered the conversation here, so thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. Charlie Ray? Uh, yeah, thanks for including me, Yona. I, you know, in the past that we've had these, we've had these sessions, and I've talked about the the role of diplomacy and, and international cooperation in in addressing these. And I think that this past year with the COVID pandemic and and now tying the impact that the pandemic has had on on global terrorism in the past and in the future, it further reinforces this need for a a global cooperative effort to, to not only address these problems as they occur, but to try and identify them and, and put measures in place to prevent them as much as possible. And I, I would hope that, that as this report gets out, it gets out widely to those people who are responsible for creating such conditions uh, and that we do more, uh, much, a much better job of international cooperation than we've done the past year. And thanks again for including me. Thank you. Uh, Nati? Well, the same. Jonak, thank you very, very much for your invitation to share in this uh, very interesting, distinguished, and nice group. It has been really uh, a very good experience and to see everyone's uh, point of view and very different areas, but all the same, uh, the same point, the same core. So a pleasure to meeting you, all of you. I'm very, very nice. I'm happy to see you, Jonah, really. Thank you very much. Uh, Milton? Okay, okay I, I'm going to turn this uh, to you in one, one second. You know, as I, I'm thinking about this uh, in, in the context of maybe 60, um, closer maybe to 70 years, I, I really uh, think again and again uh, about the famous, I think, statement or observation or insight of Albert uh, Einstein, um, both as a scientist and a human rights activist, uh, when, when he said that uh, the world is too dangerous to live in, not because of the people who do evil, but because of the people who stand by and let them. And I think we, we still have a major educational mission to teach 
the next generation how to cope with the next pandemic or terrorist threat uh, and so on. And uh, the question is, uh, who is going to be in charge? Uh, I still would like to say something. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think the one point that we haven't talked too much about today is the large importance of cyber, of big data, of artificial intelligence. Cyber attack is just growing in a fantastic way and will influence every aspect of our society. Like cyber attack may be included perhaps as a weapon of mass destruction as um, it, it takes over in war and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We touched, we touched on it very briefly, Guy Roberts, but at any rate, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, now I would like to turn the discussion to our colleague, Professor Don Wallace. You know, Yona, listening to this fantastic program of yours, I think it scared the hell out of me. I think Einstein, of course, is right as always. I think uh, Dr. Buss made a very good point. We talked about the threat environment. I think we're going to have to prioritize them. Can't do everything or, or do some things more seriously. I think as a human race, we've got to become more serious and maybe more humble. I think climate, of course, is devastating. You know, we'd had more time. I was going to ask the question to Bob Turner, which I don't expect him to answer. It's rather narrow, but you know, in the United States, we have a powerful issue of morale and reason, as the ambassador suggested. And I was curious to know what's going to happen with the prosecution of all of these January 6, um, uh, the mob. A lot is going to come out. We're going to learn a lot about ourselves. It's going to enable us to mobilize uh, a different dimension. I mean, the, the normal presidency does not encounter sort of the requirement that we restore our country to sanity, you know. So quite apart from all the things we're going to be have to doing with respect to Iran and even climate and all of the things we've discussed today, we have got to restore some sanity and a sense of judgment and proportion to our country. And as I always enjoy listening to the ambassador because that's one of the jobs ambassadors have. They really have two jobs. One is to report to their own country, and the other is to report to us. And so we learn as the ambassador, but I really think we have a profound problem. We all know this, it's nothing new. But again, as a lawyer, and Bob's a lawyer, it will be interesting to see whether these prosecutions can be used. Now, they're going to be done by ordinary prosecutors, but if they can be used to restore some understanding to what really afflicts us, I think that'll be awfully important. Um, but, you know, ultimately, the, I agree with the ambassador. I think one, you know, uh, my daughter once said, you can either be an optimist or a peppermist. Huh. I, think, <laughs> I think optimism is the required strategy. You know, it's, you know, Dostoevsky once said, if there's no God, you have to invent one. If there's no reason for optimism, you better find one, because it's the only way we can function in all these matters. And within that framework, then you can begin to address the specifics. We have to have that view. And Yona, Yona himself is evidence for the kind of for optimism. Look at how long he's flourished with, a, I would say, an unimpaired youthful enthusiasm. So I think if we follow Yona, we'll, we'll end up all right. So thank, thank you. Let me, uh, the day after Jimmy Carter won the election as president in 1970. Six, I wrote a memo to Senator Bob Griffin, my boss, and I said, we didn't, you didn't vote for him and I didn't vote for him, but he's the only president we're going to have for the next four years, and we need to set aside the partisanship that has divided our country so badly, and I recommend, he was in line to be the minority leader of the Senate, it didn't happen, Howard Baker beat him by one vote, but I strongly believe uh, that particularly in foreign affairs, we have to set aside partisanship. And I've watched as uh, I worked in the Senate and uh, for a while I was the acting assistant secretary of state for legislative affairs during the Reagan administration. And I've never seen it as divided as it is. We've lost almost all of the moderates in Congress. Uh, I've, I've, I've commented more than once that if we had uh, uh, bin Laden on one hill and the head of the opposition political party on another hill and our congressman only had one round and a sniper rifle, 
uh, they probably wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't fire because they couldn't decide which one they wanted to kill the most. Uh, we, we, you know, I watched the events on January 6th, and I had, a, I had a, a different reaction than a lot of people. The First Amendment protects the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. My sense was the overwhelming majority of people who gathered there didn't, were not armed, were not there to shut down the government or anything. They were there to express their opposition, their, their, their honestly held but I think clearly wrong belief that the election had been stolen. But I think they have a right to do that, just as the Black Lives Matter people had a right to protest, you know, in, in the other cases, a, a relatively small number, I would, would say in the, in the low hundreds, broke into the Capitol building, uh, did some vandalism. Uh, I, I don't think that most of them were armed. I keep, I keep hearing thousands of armed people attack the cap the capital. I, I, I just, maybe I'm wrong. I don't see it. it, it there were deaths. There was one woman was a protester was killed by a uh, Capitol policeman. So it was one stroke and one heart attack, but uh, I did not get a sense that the majority of the protesters were there to, uh, to do violent things, uh, but we we have to to bring our country together. I, I am so. I used to keep two TVs on in my home, one on Fox News, one on CNN, thinking I'd get different perspectives. But I've gotten to the point where I can barely bear watching either, because they are so partisan these days, and I, and I I don't know the answer. You but have to look at the racial matter because she's entertaining. Yeah, it, it has to do with putting our country ahead of our party. Uh, you know, Arthur Vandenberg, a Michigan senator uh, who chaired the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he argued that nothing is in a 40, 1949 February speech uh, in Detroit. He said nothing has happened to allow either Republicans or Democrats to put their party ahead of their country. Uh, and those who do will serve neither themselves nor their parties. And we, we need to, to get back to bipartisanship. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, I keep hearing, we want to, uh, to re-educate or retrain the, the people that are thinking badly. It, it reminds me of the thought reform of the, of the Leninists. You know, they would have re-education camps where people would be sent so they wouldn't have... Uh, uh, diverse viewpoints. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, our social media companies are silencing people because they think their views are wrong. And, and I was at the University of Virginia for a third of a century, not including my time there as a student. Uh, Tom Jefferson, uh, in a December 1820 letter to uh, William Roscow, said this institution will be open to all points of view. For here we are not afraid to tolerate error so long as reason is left free to combat it. That to me ought to be the guiding principle of our country. We ought to allow people who have bad ideas and have mistaken ideas to argue them, even, even racist ideas, because we're gonna educate them better uh, through dialogue than through suppression by driving them underground and so forth. And I, uh, there are a number of issues that I've worked on. I still think the Vietnam War was a necessary war. And I can't find anyone on the left to debate that. I still think Thomas Jefferson ought to be one of our heroes. His, uh, his actions on race and slavery were incredible. When they wrote the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery at the end of the Civil War, they chose language that Jefferson had drafted 70 years earlier, trying to prohibit slavery in the Northwest Territories. In the Declaration of Independence, in his Bill of Particulars, he denounced King George for imposing slavery upon the colonies. That language was stricken because South Carolina and Georgia threatened to walk out of the convention. But he had an incredibly enlightened view uh, for his time, uh, certainly not by today's standards, but you know, I keep seeing people want to tear down Jefferson statues and rename schools. 
And my sense is people do not understand, you know, who the man was and what he did in so many different areas. And, and if we allow people to suppress the idea that he was a decent person who we ought to take pride in, uh, I think we, we, we hurt our country. And I, I would say the same thing if somebody wanted to speak w well about uh, Malcolm X or any of a number of other people who a lot of people you know, don't think well of. I, to me, the solution is, 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 is more dialogue and the opportunity to enlighten people and to exchange ideas rather than suppression. And I, I sense there's a real movement towards suppressing ideas that we don't like and think so, Rob, I think the real answer is, more, is, is another bit of Thomas Jefferson. We need much more education. Yes, know? yes. We be so much better educated. Listen, I think I better call this to a close because otherwise we'll go on forever. Uh, and I wanted to thank Yona once again. We're looking forward to the publication, Yona. Uh, everyone is welcome to send their PowerPoints, Rita, or their slides, Natividad. And, uh, and uh, so thank you all very much. And as we say, hasta la vista. Goodbye. Hasta la vista. Thank you, well done. Hasta Bye -bye. Gracias.